Am I on? All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Ooh. Which way does it go? There we go. <laughs> now, to you, um, I have a habit of forgetting my reading glasses, so if you notice me standing on my tiptoes, we, uh, that's why. It's not in... Uh, I think it's far enough away. I think I can do it still. Anyways, this morning, or this week as I was um, preparing and reading, I haven't uh, spoken for a few months. So there was maybe 40 or 45 different things that were going through my brain as I was, uh, as I was trying to prepare and reading. When I prepare for a sermon, I usually just read chapter upon chapter upon chapter of the Word of God. And then... You know, Saturday night, I just kind of work on it. Sunday morning is usually when it comes together. This morning, I was walking over here. It still wasn't quite all together. I was still debating two places to go. Uh, but if you, uh, as the people who know me as a pastor, and what I'm going to speak on is, is something very close to my heart. I believe it is absolutely, completely necessary for the kingdom of God to move out. We sang, about, we sang this morning about the earth is filled with his glory. Now the glory of God, we look at his creation and you see the glory you see in all the beauty of nature. But his earth is filled with his glory through the church, through his people. We exude the glory of God to those who do not know him and to one another. And that comes through the unity and the oneness of his church. So I'm going to speak out of Isaiah 58. This is one of the first sermons that I gave, one of the early ones when I first started preaching. <laughs> I remember hearing Terry talk about how when the first time he preached, all he did was cry through the sir. I did the exact same thing. <laughs> and somehow, <laughs> the, the Lord worked through the people. There was things going on out there that I had no clue that was happening. People were, and I, they're coming up and telling me these things. And I said, wow, how did that happen? But the word of God is true, and it has power. So let's, let's pray before we start. I don't, probably don't remember the prayer, but repeat after me. <laughs> <laughs> Dear, Lord Jesus, Dear Lord Jesus, speak to our hearts, to our hearts and change our, lives. change our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Name we pray. Amen. 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 I hope that was close. So Isaiah 58, Isaiah was an incredible man. I remember uh, when I was first saved, God just spoke to me all the time. And the first time that he really broke through, we were, that, he really, that I really experienced that we were in Grand Forks, B.C. I was working um, for a particle board plant. I was an uh, electrician there. And I was standing, we had this big uh, um, storehouses where they stored the dust that came in and, the, and the, that they turned in to make the particle board. And I was standing on top of this thing and, I, and, I, and something hit me. And I just, I, boom, I just was down. <laughs> and and I, I had just read about Isaiah when Isaiah realized that the Spirit of God hit him and he said, he, be, he was undone. He says, I'm done for I'm unworthy. I'm unworthy before you. And then, and then it talks about the burning coals and it touched the lips with the coals. And, pure, and that's what God does to us. He turns our unworthiness into worthiness. And Isaiah, the first thing he did was say, God, whatever you have to do, send me. Send me. I will go and do whatever you have for me to do. And he would speak to me and speak to me, and, and, and this is what he imprinted in my heart. In the kingdom of God, we have many people that teach, that preach, that, 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 that guide people the way. And, and it seems like he puts something in somebody's heart that's who they are. It's not that they don't teach about other things. And we need all those things. All put together. As people stand up, he says, there's in, within a congregation, within a church, there are teachers, there are preachers, there are, there are all kinds of them. 
And he has embedded in our hearts things that are dear to us. So I'm going to read, uh, I'm going to start Isaiah 58. I'm going to start, uh, I'm going to read verses 1 to 5. So it says, Shout it aloud and do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their rebellion and to the house of Jacob their sins. For day after day they seek me out. They seem eager to know my ways as if they were a nation that does what is right and, God, and has not forsaken the commands of its God. They ask me for just decisions and seem eager for God to come near them. Why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen it? Why have we humbled ourselves and you have not noticed? Yet on the day of your fasting you do as you please. You exploit all your workers, your fasting ends in quarreling and strife and in striking each other with wicked fists. You cannot fast as you do today and expect your voice to be heard on, on high. Is this the kind of fast I have chosen, only a day for a man to humble himself? Is it only for bowing one's head like a reed, or for lying on sackcloth and ashes? Is that what you call a fast? So Jesus is, or God is, is, is speaking to the people. And he's saying, you seem eager to, 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 to not want to know me. You seem eager to hear my voice. You seem eager for me to, to, to intervene in your lives and bring blessing. But he says, you have no idea who I am. He says, you know, have no idea what I need to release it. Because God is a God of truth. God is a God that never changes. And he says, there are ways to release what I have for you. This is how it is done. He says, I need you to understand something. I don't need you to just to do all these things that, that just, just to show to people how righteous and glory, glorious you think you are. I need you to be, to, be, to be humbled. And I see this, I've seen this in my 20 years as a believer where the church has struggled and I've heard people cry out to God and I've heard them and, and, and they, they get even upset at it because the, nothing seems to be happening. But it's because they're expecting God to, to come and do things for them. And, it, and it's like salvation. We, we always talk about how much God loves us and that, that, that that's all that matters. And ma that, that is all that matters, really, that God that loves us. But God says, it is what you do and how you live will show you if you love me. It says, if you come within and, and read my words and, 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 and my statutes and my laws and who I am and, and, and apply them to your life and begin to live a life, I know that you love me. And I cannot help but pour out all the things that I have because that is who I am. That is who I am. I will not change. I expect... He, we, we, we come to the kingdom and salvation and, and, and when you're first saved, you need to be, to be taught and you need to be, have the spiritual milk and the things, yeah, Jesus loves you. God loves you. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you're struggling with even right now. Jesus loves you. They need that. They need to be reaffirmed. They need to have that in their heart because without that, you'll go out and the enemy will steal everything from you. We have to have a revelation from God of how much he loves us. One of the other sermons I was thinking of doing was out of Daniel chapter 9 where, where he's praying and he gets a visitation and, and, and this is, you know, when you first prayed, a command was given and this was like a long time, 30 days later or whatever it was. But the first thing the angel said, the first thing that the, the man said to him was, God, you, you are loved by God. You are special in God's heart because you seek him. He sees what you do and he knows that you love him because you have put your life down for this nation and you have done what's needed to be done. So God is saying, is this, is these things, is it just, just uh, surface things, things that you can do that people can see? Is this what I have asked? Is this what I have asked you to do as fasting? Verses 6 and 7, it says, it, it, is, it is not this kind of fasting that I have chosen. 
is this or is not this the fa kind of fasting I have chosen? So now he's going to open it up. Now my message, I don't know give titles by message. My message is recipe for success of the kingdom of God. And I believe that this entire word is the recipe for success <laughs> in the kingdom of God. But there is a, something the church needs to understand and how God wants to work through us. And he says, this is the kind of fasting I have chosen, to loose the chains of injustice, to untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, to break every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked, to clothe them and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood. So he's speaking to the nation and he's saying... This is what I ask you to do, to die to yourself. This is the type of fast that I am asking. That whatever you have, however much or little you may think it is, I'm just asking for it so that we can bless the nations, so that we can fill the earth with God's glory, so that the people will see that God is good, they will look at the church and they will look at his people and they will not anymore see the division. They will no longer see the things that cause strife within the body of believers that has caused so much trouble over the years. They will no longer hear about the things that are happening on the, on the, on the dark side. They will see love. They will see acceptance. They will go and say, you know, I'm really in trouble, but th there's somebody or there's a place I can go. I talk into who whatever, and they went there and they were helped and they got restored and refreshed and, and whatever it was. So he's saying to, the, to Israel, he's setting them up and saying, this is what I'm asking for, to loose the chains of injustice, untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free, to break every yoke. There are so much oppressed people on this earth. Even within the church, people struggling, people unsure of who they are, people just unable to, to, to let God in. And a lot of times our depression is fueled, and, and those things are fueled because all we think about is the thing of our depression. And God is saying, you need to look up. You need to look up. Because if you continue to look at whatever problems you have, they'll just continue to grow. We used to teach, when I taught driver ed, I used to say, when we were teaching, to look where you want to go and steer for that place. I said, don't look at the tree and try to miss it, because <laughs> you'll hit the one over here. I said, look where you want to go where there's, and go there. Focus your eyes on the safe spot. Look up to the horizon and see what's coming. Focus on what's going on. Because if you look at all the things you want to miss, you're probably going to hit them. You're probably, you, know, you're, you want to steer to the place where God is. Look up. Uh, verses 8 to 10. He says, if you do this, if, you, if your heart turns to this, if you die to yourself, and the, the New Testament teaching is all about dying. The New Testament, Paul, that's what he constantly, constantly, when the Corinthians were having so much trouble, he was calling, just die to yourself. You guys have the stuff in place where you could be so powerful and so mighty, even in, in the things, even in your own selfishness, the power of God is working through you. You guys are just using it in the wrong way. He says, if you could just divert that and die and understand what I need from you. He says, he says, when you do this, then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing of finger and malicious talk, if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then 
your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like a noonday. So he's saying, do you want to be free? If you want to be free, here it is. And it's interesting that he kind of, in that little, those few verses where he's talking about the blessings that will come your way, he just kind of puts in here, but you need to stop the pointing of fingers and the malicious talk. These things that happen behind the scenes when we're not satisfied with what's happening. Where we're looking at whatever the leaders of the churches or whatever, some people, and we look at it, we say we're, we're not happy with it, which, which is not the problem. It's not, that's not the problem. It's okay to say, you know, I'm not sure about this. You know, I don't know if this is really what we should be doing. But God said even with that, there is a way to do this the right way. There was a way to bring this up. But he says, when we go in behind the scenes and we start to gather and we start to talk and we start to murmur and we start to, to come against what's going on in the background, those are things that bring oppression. Those are things that, that cause uh, strife within the church. Because within a church, many churches or whatever, there are different factions there's a group here, and there's a group there, and there's a group here that all think a different way. And God says, that's not a bad thing. He says, I have given that to you to work with this group over here that I have given this, and, that, and we can do this together and work on this. And he says, when you come together in unity, the book of Psalms, there's a, and we used to sing this in, 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 in Stoughton, the place of commanded blessing where believers in unity dwell. The song goes, there is a place of commanded blessing in a place where you believers dwell. A place where the oil, anointed oil is flowing and we live as one. The psalm says that the unity of the believers, there was a commanded blessing in that. That God says, I cannot help. When the unity of the church comes together in, the, in what I have given, and we, we, we lay our lives down for one another, and we just say to God, I am here for them. I am here for the lost in the world only. Jesus stood on the hill and looked over Jerusalem. And he wept. It says that he just lost it. His heart was broken for what was coming. And he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if only you would allow me to sweep you under my wing of protection. But he says, I cannot do it. Why? Because you've each gone your own way. You've each gone your own way. And you've gone out of my protection. Many believers today have gone their own way and, and out of the protection of God. The church is the protection of God. The believers are the protection of God. The glory of God resides within us. Yes. And he says, the glory of God will be your rear guard. It'll be each and every one of you who are standing there to pick me up if I fall, to offer help if I have nothing, if I'm struggling that they are there. If we could understand this concept, we would understand what the scripture says, what it says, bring your tithes and your offerings and everything you have and the storehouses of God will overflow. You know, we've taught that about a spiritual thing, something that's up in heaven. The storehouses are right here. If we all just gave what God had us to give, we, there would be no problems. This house that they want to open up for, for those people who need it, it would, it would be there. If we wanted to go out and do this to minister to the community or, or whatever it is, it would be there. Because God says if we just bring what he has asked us to bring, the storehouses will overflow. And there will be nothing. You see, in my heart, the vision of the church that he has given to me, that the church is not just something within the community. The church is the community. The church is the community. You need a job? We got it. You need, to be, you need to be healed. We got that. I, I see in, in my vision of the church that the hospitals are full of people, praying people, 
who lift up to God. I'm not saying there wouldn't be medicine, there wouldn't be doctors, but they would go to God. The first thing they would do, there would be businesses with godly people just, just getting wealthy. Why? Because they want to bless the, the community. They want to open up uh, the blessings of everything that God has given. And the church is the light in the community that people look to as we lift up Christ in the wilderness. But he says we have to start by just giving up ourselves. And the beauty of that is that as I give up myself, and even if I give what I, what I think I don't have, I give out a sacrifice, I give more, he says, because the whole body is doing that, it's coming right in the back door from somebody else given to you. Because the glory of God is working through everyone. And that is the church. That is the church. As I give, it just keeps, it flows. So he says, the hearts of my church, I need you to understand. To release the blessings, to release everything, I need you to work in my fullness. I need you to understand who I am. I need you to, to be able to teach the young ones. I need you to be a light to them. I need you to be a light to the generations that are coming. We are not just, just ministering to, to until, you know, however long we live. We are ministering to the generations. As long as the church is here on earth, we are ministering to the generations because we are raising up the people of God to go out, to go out and minister to the generations after them. In verses 11, to 11 and 12, he says, Then the Lord will guide your, you always. The Lord will guide you always. The Lord will guide you always. How many times have I heard people say, I don't know what God wants. I don't know what he's saying. He's saying, if you just give up. If you just give up. It just, it's just strange. Like God is really strange to us when we think about it in our carnal mind. If you just give up. Just give it all up. Like you have nothing. Because if I have nothing, I have nothing to lose. I have nothing to lose and everything to gain. Because everything I have belongs to Him. And the kingdom of God receives glory. So He will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun scorched land. Satisfy your needs. No. My needs and what God thinks my needs are sometimes differ a little bit. But he says, I will satisfy your needs. You see, Jesus isn't walking on the earth anymore. But the Holy Spirit is. He's walking through each and every one of us. And when we gather together, Paul says, don't you understand that you together are the temple of God? And everything that is needed within that temple is right here. Everything. The church has so long been set up in a place that it's doomed to fail. We set it up and, and, and one person. We, we put one person up there. We say, you bring the glory of God to this community and to this church. And then when they die, we say, well, next And it's just, and it's just, it, we're, we, it's set up to fail. God says, yes, there are, pla there are pastors, there are teachers, there are, there are all these things. But there are so many. There are so many of you that we need to hear from. There are so many out there that God is speaking to that we need to hear. There are those of you that he has put healing in your hands. We need you to come forward and, and begin to, to, to minister what God has given. The kingdom of God. I gave, a, when I was speaking, one time at Stoughton, I was, God gave me a word. He says, you know, if somebody came into your town and say, well, how many churches do you have? The answer should be one. Because we're one. 
we're all one. If we are under the, the, the lordship of Jesus Christ, if we have, have given our life over to the kingdom of God, there is no denominations in the kingdom of God. There is no Jew, there is no male, there is no female. There is none. The denominational things that we have set up and the, the way that man has taken it, we're, we're, we have set ourselves up to fail. There needs to be a revelation of God. And this is not a message slamming anybody. It's just the way things are. When I was first saved, I used to... Uh, God used to speak to me so powerfully when I go to work. I would be, and all of a sudden it would just hit me. And I had this place <laughs> in the electrical room where nobody could find me. <laughs> because I could not, I would just, and I would sit there. Sometimes for a couple of hours. Now I'm supposed to be working. <laughs> And God would just speak. And, and, and it was, it, I would get up and I would go out. And I would just be praising God, singing. And I'd be weeping and the other believers would say, what the heck is the matter with you, man? <laughs> They're going to think you're nuts. And I'd say, I can't help it. And then I'd have to go, good thing my boss was a Christian and he understood. <laughs> I'd go, well, I was... Uh, <laughs> But I found out later that his son, who worked there as well before he went out in, in the mission field, he was a forklift driver. He used to take his, his forklift to get a big pallet of, of, of particle board, move it out of the pile, turn around and back in, and do the exact same thing. <laughs> <laughs> and sit there and allow God to fill him up. And you see, these are the things that God was speaking to me. And, and I would bring these up and the people would say, well, no, no, no. And finally, I just kind of, okay. Because so I, just, I was just young in the Lord. I didn't, you know. But it just didn't seem to work. It just didn't seem that, that people were being set free. There's a, there's a man that's, a, that's constantly on my mind. He was a, an ex-biker who got saved, and he struggled. And he struggled, but man, he had a heart. But we always just looked at the outside. We always just looked at the outside. Well, if you would just get rid of this, or if you would just get rid of that, just like this says, is that what I want, Really? And finally, he, 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 he struggled so hard that he just almost went nuts. You know, that is not what God has sent us here. That is not what God wants us to do here in the kingdom of God. He says he wants us to break those oppressions, not by pointing a finger. Not by, not by telling people, well, you're not good enough yet. But by just opening our arms. Even when he talks about the unity of the church, the gifts, he said, even those, even those things that are less desirable, we cover. We protect. We don't expose them to the world and to, to shame. There's a story about... Um, who am I talking about? What's the story? It's about Noah when his sons, when he goes out and gets drunk... And he's laid out in the tent and his sons come in to cover the blanket. And they turn. And they back in and they cover. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to turn our back on what we see. And the things that we think are the problem in somebody's life. And he wants us to cover them. Cover them with prayer. Cover them with love. Cover them with blessing so that they can be restored or brought up and, and, and become those people that God wants them to be. Yeah. 
So he says, I'll satisfy your needs in the sun-scorched land. So we pray to God with our needs. And we're waiting for something to drop down from heaven. But the Word of God tells me that here's my answer. My answer resides within the church of God. That everything that I need is right here. You know, he says, what good is it if somebody comes to you and say, well, I need some. You say, well, I hope everything goes well for you. I'll pray for you. How often have we done that? How often is that the way that we do? Well, the praying for them is good. But God says, maybe, be, maybe that they're standing there before you. Maybe you're the answer to that prayer. Maybe there's something you could do. Somewhere you could do whatever. You will be like a well-watered garden like a spring whose waters never fail. Let me tell you, just every day, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God was just alive. The water was flowing. Since we've moved here, I'm, t- I'm telling you, all hell has broken loose. It just seems like every single thing that could go wrong has gone wrong. It just seems like, and at the v- absolute worst time, I tell you, this is not that easy sometimes. That the water, the wells, the spring is flowing. And whoa. Sometimes it feels like, well, that's a nice spring, but I'm a little deep. It's going over my head here. <laughs> <laughs> but what? We look at that we say, what? And sometimes I, it's hard to say, God says, look at me. And he says, if there's much, this much opposition coming with you, what must be on the other side of that? Yeah. Don't faint. Yeah. Don't fail. Right. Don't stop. Yes. Because on the other side is the glory that I have. Yes. Because God says, I need to test to see if you're going to stand. I need to see if you are going to count the cost yes. and be able to finish the building that you have started. And so he says, don't faint. Hang on, look at me here. Keep coming. You better start wrapping this up. <laughs> this script, this next couple of scriptures, uh, there's a few scriptures that just blow me away. He says, Your people will rebuild the ancient ruin and will raise up the age old foundations. You will be called Repair of the Broken Walls. King James says the repairer of the breach. Restorer of the streets with dwellings. Take a look at what God has for us to do. Take a look out there. It's broken. They don't have any answers. And God says, if you will just die to yourselves, Live for one another. And for those who are out there who are lost, he says, you will rebuild the ancient ruins. You will be the ones who repair the broken walls. What's he saying? You are salvation to the earth. We are salvation to a lost and dying world. God says, whatever you forgive on earth, I'll forgive in heaven. Whatever you don't forgive on earth, I will not forgive in heaven. Look at the power we have. Look at the power that he has given to us. He says says to us that he has given us the right to partake in who he is. In everything that he has. He says he has given us, he has given us the church. He has given us permission to go out and bring salvation to the lost nations and to bring hope to the world. But he says we cannot do it if we do not follow his statutes, if we do not follow who he is, if we do not have something that the world can look at that is different, that is apart from, that is separate from him, from them. Why are we separate from the world, not part of the world? Because we are one, we have given up our lives. The world is self, and all they want to do is do what's good for them. He says, if you live in this kingdom, you cannot live in this kingdom. There is a line that's drawn. 
It doesn't mean perfection. It doesn't mean that we sometimes aren't struggling and, and that, that, that's not what it means. What it means is go for this side. What it means is continue to work for this side. For the side that's going to bring salvation to the world and to the people and to restore the community. There's no reason on heaven and earth why this community cannot be turned completely to God. If our attitude is no, then it's not going to happen. I will not forgive on earth what you will not forgive. We will not forgive this community. We will lift up its problems. We will lift up how evil it is. We will, we will, we will do all these things. And the forgiveness of God is bound. Because those who he has sent to bring forgiveness will not. But he says if we lift up the glory of God and we just go out and we offer forgiveness, we offer help, we offer healing to whoever who shall come. If we offer the living springs of water to whoever, it does whatever they look like. He says my forgiveness and my spirit will pour out from heaven and you will not stop the spirit of God. Because his people have come to the place. I cannot do it on my own. Pastor Terry cannot do it on his own. Nobody can do this on their own. We need the glory of God to be our rear guard. And the people of God to lift one another up. Because as a pastor or as a leader of the church, we are just part of the body. That's it. We are not the head. We are not the head. Christ is the head. And he says, you are a part that sits in the, within the body. You have a, something to do that I have given to you. But so is every one of you. If you don't feel a part of the church, and I can tell you right now that here I feel that the freedom for us to express who we are and to bring the gifts that God has given to us is probably greater than every, any place I've been. I would, if you're not going out and experiencing and doing the things that God has for you, it's your fault. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say something else, but I changed that for a second. Why? Because God just says, come out. And he has some very stern warnings about sitting and burying your gift. Read about the parable of the talents. It's... He says, I don't care if you fall down. I don't care if you fail. All I'm, I'm wondering is if you're going to get back up again. Yes. If you're going to focus on me and just get it back up and let the people around you reach down their hands and, and give you a hand up and give you all you need. I remember when we did live in Grand Forks, we didn't have any money at all. I had... Uh, Moved from, I was wiry houses and I, that job was done and got nothing. We did like yard work, sometimes like five dollars for a lawn. We'd make, we were, we were sitting around talking with some of the guys over <laughs> and they were talking about like one work, they each worked at a, a lumber mill, one in each in different town. And one guy, well, I think I, he said, I made $65,000 last year. I can't remember what the conversation was, but anyways, they were talking. The other guy says, well, well, I made like 55 or something. And they kind of turned to me, well, how did you do? I think we made uh, $12,000 <laughs> last year. But it was just incredible. We never missed anything. We, were, we didn't have a lot of stuff. We drove cars that we had to stop, you know, a couple blocks away from the school to let the kids out. <laughs> and then we had to... When we drove places we used to drive, it's a 14-hour drive. We used to take these things. Remember, we continued to ask uh, Karen's sister-in-law lived there. We asked if she wanted to come. Nope. <laughs> nope. We finally got a decent van. She came with us. <laughs> but let me tell you about the prayer life that comes out of that. We pray for those old things. <laughs> right, once we come home and the thing just died. <laughs> No, I'm a, no, we stopped at the side of the road for something. I remember, and I'm thinking, don't shut the car off. And I shut it off. <laughs> and so we got back in the car, and it wouldn't start. 
So I said, well, God, I don't know what's wrong with this thing. I were praying. It's, it's, I got no money. We just got hardly money to get home. And so I turned the key and boom. And that old thing just did what we needed. Whatever we needed. He said, I will give what you need. If you give up your life for me. So the repair of the breach. <clears throat> if you keep from breaking the Sabbath and from doing as you please on, this is 13 to the end. On my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the Lord's holy day honorable, and if you honor it by not going your own way and not doing as you please speaking or speaking idle words, then you will find your joy in the Lord. And I will cause you to ride on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. To feast on the inheritance. What has God given us? Everything the kingdom of God has to offer. Everything the kingdom of God has to offer. Jesus said, the things that you see me do, you will do greater. Because there will be so many of you. You will be everywhere. We need to understand the, 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 the unity of the believers is not an option in the kingdom of God. It is not an option to not have unity. If we have differences, if we have strife, okay, fine. But let's work it out. Paul says, let's talk about this, and I'm sure that the Lord will give us the truth. But do not sit there behind the scenes and murmur and gossip and cause strife and cause division. Because you are working against Christ himself. And that is a hard statement. Because Christ is unity. Christ is everything. When he prayed to God, what did he pray? Make them one, Father, as you and I are one. Jesus didn't go to the apostles and all of them and say, you know, I think God is not doing something right here. <laughs> he says, I only do what my Father in heaven tells me to do because we are one. So if we are one with that, we will be doing what our Father in heaven wants us to do. Every day, every situation that comes up, it says when it says be in the Spirit always, that can happen. That can happen because we have given up our rights. We have given up. We have become, as they say, the slaves to our master. But he does not treat us as slaves. He treats us as inheritance, inheritance to the kingdom of God. And he said, if you could just understand that. If you just understand that there is a whole world out there that is waiting for you. They are waiting for us. They are waiting for an answer. They are waiting for God to be lifted up high by his people. Let's close with Romans chapter, what chapter did I give you, 12? Yeah, chapter 12. Well, we'll kind of close, two verses. I'm going to go here in the Dax and that's it. <clears throat> so in the book of Romans, Paul is, 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 is setting up the kingdom of God. He is preaching, he is speaking through this things that just are driving some of these people crazy. They just don't understand. So the first two verses of chapter 12 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, now listen to what this says. This is your spiritual act of worship. So what was he saying to the, to, the, to the nation of Israel? Those things that you're doing mean nothing in the kingdom of God. They are just show. He said, here is your spiritual act of worship. To live as a living sacrifice, you'll be holy and pleasing to God spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, which is self. 
which is self. He's saying, get out of that world and into my world. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. I don't know what God wants me to do. What should I do? Give it up. Give your body up. Give your life up as a living sacrifice. Then you will know what God's will is. Because I will be living for everyone else and not myself. The will of God. Whatever that looks like. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. And the last scripture, what is the result of this? In the book of Acts, just after the Holy Spirit comes down and pours the Spirit out. And remember, we can do none of this without the Spirit of God. If you are not filled with the Holy Spirit, you need to get it. You need to petition God. You need to come be, because you don't have to do anything, really. He says, I pour my Spirit out to all those who want it. You know, you don't want to say, oh, I, just, I don't think I'm good enough this, that. <laughs> God just says, I don't care. He says, let me fill you with life. And all those things that you're concerned about, as the song says, will grow strangely dim. All of a sudden, why aren't those things important to me anymore? Because the kingdom of God has come. And the result of the church working as one, Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship of the, and the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Of all the people. It didn't just say of the brothers and sisters, he said enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. The salvation of God comes to the earth in the unified, glorified body of Christ. And what happens? All heaven breaks loose. And the community looks. And we have favor. We have favor. And Jesus, and in Isaiah, when he says when Christ comes, he says the governments will rest on his shoulder. The governments... There are places that even the governments are becoming kingdom people because the people of God have given up and have worked in these things. Our hearts need to be changed. I can remember in those days when God was downloading all that stuff to me. I remember I would look at people and I would just see bones. And he says, those are the people who are dead, separate from me. And my heart would ache. I lost that somewhere along the way for a while. Through all the religion and all that stuff. But he has renewed that in my heart. And he has asked us to, to get up on the hill and look over the community and weep over it. And ask God to intervene. And how does he intervene? Through his church. So I'd like to pray just to close, and then I don't know who's going to close the service, or Pastor Bob. Father God, again, I do thank you for who you are. Lord God, sometimes it's hard to understand just what you have done. What you have given to us, the responsibility that we have to reach this world. 
Lord God, when we look at it in our own selves, in our own minds, in our own strength and power, we look at it and we just say it's hopeless. But when we look at it through the power of many who are filled with your Holy Spirit, who have one heart, is to serve you and to bring the glory of God to this earth and nation, to our community and to one another. Lord God, we cannot be stopped. So, Father God, I pray for each heart in here, Lord. Lord God, I thank you for the work that you're doing within these people. I thank you for the Holy Spirit that is that's coming to life. I thank you that the, the, the giant of the church is, is beginning to stir, yes. that it is beginning to wake up. Jesus. Father God, let us come to the fullness of what you have given to us. You, Lord. Lord God, whatever that looks like. Lord God, for the differences and for those things that, that, that come around, Father, I pray that we would be able to, to bring these up together, that we'd be able to, 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 to allow you to work and to bring oneness. Lord God, I pray for those who have you put, put in leadership position, Father. Lord God, I pray that they would be full of your spirit, that when they meet together to make decisions, that they, would, that they would hear your voice, that they would seek your face, and that they would get the direction that you have, that you have promised, that if we give to you, I will, I will show you where to go. So Father God, I thank you for your word, which is so powerful. I thank you for your spirit that makes it come to life. So Lord God, I pray a blessing on these people on their week. I pray your provision. I pray that uh, you would be their focus each and every day. But God, raise them up. Raise them up. Let them go forth in their gifts. Let them do the things that you have given. And therefore, you will be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, for the message of unity, Father. And when we come together as a body of believers, things happen. Promises are brought forth. The restoration that happens in families here. The restoration that has happened in our own lives. And then it comes to our families. It comes to our community. It comes to our province. It comes to Canada. And it goes to the world. every single one of you, every single one of you, to flow in your gifts, to love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, to love your neighbor as yourself. I'm just going to put this out. When's the last time did you have somebody in your house that you've never had for a long time? Man, I'm guilty of it. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes I get tired. But God just says, lean on me. Give me everything. And I will show you the glory of God. I will make your path straight. Do not get weary. Do not faint. 